How quickly do people consume Coca-Cola? According to statistics, it's around 8,400 servings per second. Surprisingly, very few people know the exact recipe for this popular soft drink. Just like Heinz has its secret ketchup and KFC its 11 secret herbs and spices, the Coca-Cola company has its own secret soda recipe. And although their ingredients are listed on the label, imitators attempt to recreate it with varying degrees of success. The production of Coca-Cola begins with water, which must be distilled. After several steps, the water is sent to the syrup cooking area, where it's mixed with sugar and the secret ingredient, the concentrate that imparts the drink's distinctive flavor. This concentrate is produced in all five of the Coca-Cola company's factories worldwide, while other factories handle the bottling process. It's known that the concentrate is based on corn syrup or sugar, and is enriched with dye, orthophosphoric acid, caffeine, and flavorings. The final steps involve carbonation and bottling. We could tell you that caramel was first mentioned more than 3,000 years ago in Greece and China, but let's get straight to the point. More specifically, the production lines of caramel. Manufacturers typically use starch molasses or invert sugar syrup as a base, to which water, sugar, coloring, flavoring, and other components are added. The resulting mixture must first be boiled down to the desired state and then cooled to about 85 degrees Celsius to give it the desired shape. When the mass forms the familiar hard candy, they're cooled to room temperature. They're then packaged and distributed first to warehouses and then to stores. China, the United States, and Germany were the countries that consumed the most chocolate in 2020. These three countries accounted for 32% of global consumption, which is 11.2 million tons of chocolate. So there's no time for chocolate factories to sit idle. They might even be receiving fresh shipments of cocoa beans right now. These beans need sorting, roasting to remove their shells, and grinding. The resulting mass is put into the oven, where the ground beans release their oil at a temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. It's then mixed with sugar and other ingredients like nuts and berries. If there's not enough oil, they'll add more. The mass then needs to be stirred, which takes about three days. This helps to make the chocolate more flavorful. Finally, it's time to pour the chocolate into molds, and then the packers have to work hard. By the way, the aluminium foil isn't just for preventing the chocolate from absorbing other odors, it also helps to keep it cool.
Nestle believes that Nescafe is the world's favorite coffee. And that is why we have come to the Nescafe factory. Production begins with coffee beans. If ground coffee's needed, it has to be roasted, blended, ground and packaged in cans. The production of instant coffee is a bit more complicated. The first option is called agglomeration. The beans are ground to a powder, which is then mixed with water. The resulting extract is dried, the water disappears, and granules are produced. The second option is called freeze-drying. The extract is frozen and then dehydrated using hot air and a vacuum. And for the production of coffee in capsules, the beans are ground with perfect precision down to 10 microns and finally packed in capsules. Let's impress those with sweet tooths out there. Choco pie was actually invented by a South Korean company. It has conquered many countries around the world, with 44 years of choco pie sales totaling $4.6 billion. That said, the choco pie is a fairly simple product. A layer of marshmallow is placed between two layers of cake, and if necessary, a filling is added. It can be very unusual, such as condensed milk with poppy seeds. Then, everything is covered with chocolate. The task of the factories is to quickly assemble this sandwich in the correct order. First, the cakes are baked, with a massive machine producing lines of, let's say, 24 pieces. The cakes are then combined with the marshmallows. The end product is glazed, cooled, and packaged. By the way, the internet is full of homemade choco pie recipes. Maybe it's a good reason to explore the world of baking. As with potato chips, the production of French fries begins with the washing and peeling of the tubers, which are then transferred to drums where they're turned into slices. However, that's not all. According to the Daily Mirror, the slices for McDonald's are dipped in dextrose, a natural sweetener and one of the secrets behind the beautiful golden color the fries take on when fried. In addition, sodium pyrophosphate is added. You might not like it, but thanks to it, the slices retain the necessary consistency and texture. The slices are then fried, but not all the way through. The final cooking is done by McDonald's employees, and for transport, the potatoes are frozen.
scientists once studied why some foods taste good to us and others do not. It turns out that the secret lies in the five basic tastes. Here they are, from left to right, sour, bitter, sweet, salty, and umami, which is the taste of protein-rich foods. The more of these flavors a product has, the more pleasing it is to us. One of the few products that has all the flavors at once is ketchup. Let's take a walk through the factory that makes the legendary Heinz sauce. The recipe for this ketchup is a well-guarded secret, so production is automated to the maximum. But there's no secret in the number 57 on the bottle. They are the two lucky numbers of the company founder Henry J. Heinz and his wife. Maybe that's why Heinz is so successful. Although Red Gold, the largest tomato processing company in the United States, has no lucky numbers on its cans. But its canned tomatoes are not only delicious, but the tastiest in the world. Red Gold's distribution center covers 93,000 square meters, and inside, each tomato goes through 11 stages, is washed 7 times, and rinsed 18 times. Compared to Coca-Cola, chocolate and potato chips, fruit juice may seem like a healthy and wholesome choice. However, a single glass of store-bought juice provides your body with about 5 teaspoons of sugar. By the way, have you seen those commercials where fruit is beautifully turned into juice? Well, the pressing method is used by only 10% of manufacturers. The most common way of producing juice is to work with frozen concentrate. In this method, you simply dilute the concentrate or puree with water. But the production of the concentrate itself is quite interesting. The fruit is washed, peeled, and pressed. The water in the resulting mass is evaporated at about 65 degrees Celsius, since at higher temperatures it will lose most of its vitamins. Then, the concentrate is mixed with purified water, pasteurized, and de-aerated to remove air bubbles. It is then heated again to 60 degrees Celsius to eliminate microorganisms, and the final step is to pour the drink into sterile containers. The name Pocky comes from the Japanese word Pokiri, which describes the characteristic cracking sounds the sticks make when they break. The first Pocky sticks were coated in chocolate, and later flavors such as strawberry with coconut were introduced. Since Pocky sticks are technically a cookie, the most important step in production is the preparation of the dough. A special machine cuts it into long spaghetti-like strips, which are then baked and cut. Internet experts on the Pocky size specify that a stick should measure 15.8 cm. Once ready, the sticks are glazed and then packaged.
Did you know that the M&M's brand will not use the famous yellow and red spokes candies in its ads for a while? These characters will remain only in social media, according to the Wall Street Journal. But the production process of the famous candy will remain unchanged. Let's see how M&M's are made. It all starts with mixing the ingredients until a liquid mass of chocolate is obtained. The next step is a trip through the cooling tunnel. At the exit, you can already see something similar to M&M's, but without the colored coating that will be applied in the next phase. Thanks to the coating, the candy doesn't melt in the heat. By the way, red M&M's were banned in 1976 because they contained a harmful dye and didn't come back for 10 years. And do you like nut-flavored M&M's? Then you should know that the roasted peanuts are coated in three layers of chocolate. And while we're on the subject of M&M's, we should mention Smarties, an analogue invented in the UK and currently manufactured by the Nestle company. The manufacturing process is more or less the same as that of M&M's. Have you tried Smarties? Which of the two tastes better? Last year, an estimated 4.8 billion pounds of potato chips were consumed worldwide. Making that many potato chips is not easy, yet the production process can be summed up in just four words – peel, cut, fry, and pack. Modern equipment allows potatoes to go from sitting in the back of a truck to crispy packaged slices in just an hour. It all starts with the washing process, after which the potatoes are peeled. Powerful machines peel them in just 90 seconds. The potatoes are then sorted and sliced. The process produces slices about 1.3 millimeters thick. These slices are washed to remove excess starch, which is then sold. Meanwhile, the slices are fried at 150 degrees Celsius. A few minutes in the oil and it's time to add the spices. Here the professionals deploy all their creativity, and we get chips with flavors like avocado and wasabi, or lactobacillus soda. The last step is to bag the chips and add nitrogen so the product doesn't turn into dust along the way. 